We've all heard it before. It's who you know. Welcome to Social Capital, a weekly podcast that dives into social relationships and why the investment you put into them is so important. Your host, Lori Hybe, will connect with industry-leading professionals and dive into their networking experiences and expert advice. Hey, everybody. Lori Hybe here. Welcome to the Social Capital Podcast. Our show notes are found at socialcapitalpodcast.com. To you, the listener, I want you to know that I appreciate you and I'm thrilled to have you here for another episode. If there's ever anything that I can do to support you, please reach out. LinkedIn is the channel that you'll find me on. Just search for Lori Hybe. You can simply click the follow button as I post daily information about marketing strategy, tips, all podcast episodes, and any upcoming events you might be able to see me at. If you'd like to connect, just make sure to send a note with your connection request that references Social Capital. I can't wait to hear from you. Social Capital Podcast is sponsored by Keystone Click, a strategic digital marketing agency that believes in order to successfully market to your ideal customer, you have to first understand your customer. Learn more at keystoneclick.com. The topic of relationships ties very closely with marketing. That's why I'm bringing on marketing experts with a variety of backgrounds for you to learn and grow from. Today's guest is Dan Greck. Dan is the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy, whose mission is to give 10,000 underserved small businesses a simpler way to grow. Dan is a Pulitzer Prize winning former NPR and PBS journalist turned entrepreneur and educator. He is the grandson of a Philadelphia public school science teacher and of a professional soccer coach in La Ligua in Spain. I think I said that right. Maybe not. (laughs) And he carries forward a family legacy of teaching, coaching, and entrepreneurship. Dan trains business owners in the lead building system, a process proven, a proven process for online lead generation, and the thought leadership pyramid, a systematic approach to content marketing. Past career highlights include as the head of growth at two software startups and as senior director of digital marketing, the nation's largest Hispanic owned energy company. He's helped take Offercraft, a gamification SaaS company in the hospitality industry from pre-revenue to a 2.5 million run rate in just two years. Wow, impressive. Culminating in an acquisition. Fantastic. All right. There's a lot more to this bio, a lot of amazing things, but I'm going to say, Dan, welcome to the show. You know, thank you so much for having me here. And, uh, you know, it's an impressive sounding resume, but trust me, I'm way less impressive in person. Really excited to be here, uh, part of the podcast, part of the movement that you're trying to create, uh, you know, helping agency owners be, be more effective, serve their clients better. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm excited to have this conversation with you today. Let's let's talk about your um, journalistic background with your expertise sure. in interviewing subjects. How does this year impact your approach around AI? Any insights from that experience that you have? You know, what a great question. And uh, it, it's an area that I'm still figuring out because I think all of us are still figuring out AI and AI tools, but there, there are at least there are at least two ways in which my journalistic background have come into, there are actually three ways in which my journalistic background have come into direct specific play uh, when it comes to uh, AI. Mm-hmm. So it helps to just give a little bit of background. Sure. AI in the current form is really dependent or, okay, so AI is called artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence is basically getting algorithms or robots to do work for you. And the most popular, best known version of AI is ChatGPT. Mm-hmm. Um, it's what's known as generative AI, which means you you ask them a question and it creates original new answer. And there are three things that journalists know how to do really well that's very helpful with generative AI and ChatGPT. So the first is we're really good at precise communication, right? Like we're very expert as journalists in communicating things clearly and simply. And that's Mm -hmm. a really important skill when you're writing a prompt. Yes. The second is we're really good at fact-checking. And one of the big problems with AI is it, quote, hallucinates. It's it's actually the word that they use, the technical word for making shit up. (laughs) And so journalists are really good at sniffing out bullshit and fact-checking. Sure. And then the first, the third thing that we're really, really good at is interviewing. And if you actually look at what the quote prompt engineering is, which is the back and forth between uh, an AI bot and a human being, 
it is in a form a kind of an interview where you're sure. continuously deepening and asking new questions uh, and getting original responses in, repl- in return. So I, I, fi- you know, I taught all these topics uh, in journalism. I practiced them as a journalist, and I'm finding generative AI and ChatGPT like a very comfortable space for me. Yeah, I love that, um, and I, I appreciate the kind of the the validation and the, and the trust factor because that's something that I've really been kind of leery of with AI. I mean, there's a lot of articles around that. I, I asked it to write a little bio about me and a third of it was incorrect. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I think that's a really important um, point to share. Um, and your your expertise says that you have to always verify the information that you're getting. So that's fantastic. Um, can you tell us a little bit how leveraging chat GPT has changed your workflow? Perfect. So I'm still figuring this out like all of us. Uh, I really started using ChatGPT when it was released in November of 2022, late November of 2022. That was was then the holidays. So I really started in January and we're only in May Mm -hmm. right now when we're having this conversation. So we're like four months in to an epoch life-changing historic (laughs) new technology. So what I'm about to say, I'm going to say completely revise in a couple months. But I can tell you how I'm thinking about ChatGPT, and I think it's it's actually very useful. So I think of ChatGPT in a as a as an element in a technology and human stack, and I'm going to kind of walk you through what that stack is and how, where ChatGPT fits in. So at the highest level of your marketing and human stack is you, the owner, the agency, the 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 the, the high cost you know, $250 an hour resource that's doing the work. And then at the bottom of the stack is automation, right? Which is once Mm -hmm. it's built, it just does it for free automatically or with like fractions of a cent per transaction through the Mm -hmm. zap or through the, you know, monthly fee you pay for HubSpot. Yeah. So in between $250 an hour CEO fee and essentially free automation exists all the people and all the technologies you use for marketing. And ChatGPT is nearly costless. ChatGPT itself is free for 3.5, 20 bucks a month for 4.0. And then tools like Jasper, uh, Azure AI, mm-hmm. uh, others that are built on top of it, you know, have a little bit more of a fee, but it's not like huge. It's, you know, usually sub $100 a month. So mostly mm-hmm. affordable. So the tool itself is nearly free, except... You can't just use what they spit out. You have to edit it. So there is like a human fee associated with that. But generally speaking, ChatGPT is like my first place I go if I can't automate it. Yeah. And then after that, I have offshore resources. I'm based in uh, the United States. I have resources in India and the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Those folks come in under $10 an hour. That is a living wage that is a middle class wage in those countries so i always ensure whenever i work with offshore talent that i pay above the prevailing wage in their home country and you can still get that work done for sub ten dollars um data analysis um technical seo uh website development all that can be done very inexpensively offshore and then i do near shore so that's latin america mexico venezuela argentina colombia primarily yeah. And these are resources that usually come in in the sub twenty to twenty five dollar an hour range. Um, and those are very good living wages in those places. And then you go to the United States uh, where you're dealing with local talent um, and higher price and geographic specificity. So you might want them to come into your office. And those folks, you know, at minimum for an entry level, like kids straight out of school, doesn't know any, they're, they're ass from their elbow, you know, that's like 60, 50, $60,000 a year. Um, and they often are really not good, honestly, like they're not trained, they don't know a thing or two, yeah, you know, and then all the way that's up That's a to different a, conversation. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. And, and then all the way up to like a fractional, like a CMO, which is a quarter million dollars a year and above. So that's kind of the marketing technology stack from my perspective. And mm-hmm. so the way I think about AI and I use it in my workflows is I look for any opportunity I can to move work down a layer in that stack. 
sure. from a higher priced resource to a lower priced one. And then the one key thing I'll just say is if you try to use AI without human intervention, in other words, if you try to have it be your writer without your being your editor, your coder without your debugger, mm -hmm. you're going to make a huge mistake. It's not going to be to the quality that befits your brand. And you're really making a misapprehension. It's not AI versus human. It's AI plus human. You got to be a cyborg about it. Sure. Yeah. Have you, I'm curious because of the, you put a lot of emphasis on like the financial layers of, of this. Have you kind of monetized or identified how much money you saved based yeah, on I, the leveraging chat GPT in your workflow? I can give you a very concrete number. So I teach courses and one of the things I'm teaching uh, is, is in English and it needs to be translated to Spanish. And I went and I got 10 different estimates for how much it would cost to translate it. The highest estimate was $150,000. At the lowest estimate was $40,000. By leveraging ChatGPT for certain tasks, um, I was able to bring that price down to $8,000. Wow. So even if you take the lowest bid, sure. that's a $32,000 <laughs> savings. And... I actually made a choice to go a little more expensive with the voiceover. In other words, I could have actually just fed the transcript into an AI bot. It could have even imitated my voice in Spanish, and it would have cost a couple hundred bucks to do that. I chose instead to have a human being actually voice, voice it instead. Uh, that was a choice I made for two reasons. Number one, you would have been able to tell it was an AI voice. And that's a little creepy. And to spend mm -hmm. yep, hours yep. and hours <laughs> listening to that is creepy. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, number two, AI in general is really bad at emotion, whether it's text. Yep. It, it can fake, it can echo or parrot or imitate parrot. emotion, but it cannot mm -hmm. do emotion. Yeah. Yep. And there is no greater transmitter of emotion than the voice. Mm -hmm. So it would have it would have been a mistake for me to try to use AI for that. I did look into it though. Sure. Um, oh yeah, I, now, I've seen those platforms that are out there. They're interesting. Yeah, you can use like the, the basically the rule of thumb of it's fifteen seconds or less. Yeah. You can use it uh, effectively. There, there's also some really interesting examples like Deep Fake Drake. Have you heard about this? I, I've heard of deep fakes and not that so, yeah so deep fake deep fake deep fake drake is a fun little story um i'm going to actually be sharing this in next in next week's uh class uh on ai for audio and video but basically yeah. a uh, professional radio producer uh who's anonymous created a song with drake and the weekend um and it was climbing the billboard charts until universal music group got spotify and apple music to take it down wow and it was, it's a, it's a, it's better than Drake's new album. <laughs> it truly is. Like you listen to it and you're like bopping. You're like, this is good. And, and the weekend and Drake haven't collaborated in almost a decade. So it's like delicious to hear the two of them collaborate, even though it's all AI powered. Yeah. Um, goodness, we could talk AI forever. And I know you do a lot of conversations on this, but let's, let's focus a little bit more on the marketing side of things. Um, I know you, you that's, that's more your passion. Um, so I know that you believe that most small businesses practice what you call me too marketing, but when it comes down to it, you have a very unique perspective on how to differentiate the business. Can you elaborate on what me too marketing is and, and, um, what your perspective is? Yeah. So first of all, my passion isn't marketing. My passion is business storytelling and more specifically helping businesses grow. Mm -hmm. And I feel this is an important distinction because it was a big realization on my in my life that like marketing is interesting to me. Building my business and helping others build theirs is a life passion. It, I am so on fire on that. And marketing is an instrument for doing that, but it's not in and of itself a passion of mine. What sure. I'm passionate about, and I do this a lot, is seeing a business and helping them get to the next phase. And 
particularly I, I, I do really well with small businesses from micro enterprises to sub $50 million businesses. And, and really like they can mark a before and an after where BizHack and I have been in their life. And Lori, like there's literally not enough money in the world to replace that feeling of just deep and abiding satisfaction that comes with helping others. And it's sure. something that I learned from my mother uh, and my grandfather's, uh, you know, and and that is like a part of who I am. And mm. and as a result, I, you know, I probably don't make as much as I could. Um, I don't work with the deepest pocketed or largest clients. And I could, I have the resume to do it. But I, I like prefer to work with smaller businesses because, you know, when you're dealing with a Fortune 500 company, if you can get that Titanic to change one degree, you have impacted the company in an extraordinary way. Mm -hmm. I can turn companies around. So anyway, the way I do it is through business storytelling. And I have like a particular methodology. I'm writing a book on it called From Why to Thrive. And this book is about connecting your work to meaning, connecting your connecting the work you do to meaning. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, if you can find meaning in your work, mm -hmm. you're going to be more motivated. You're going to be able to survive the ups and downs. You're going to do better work. You're going to have a bigger impact in the world, like everything good. Now, that's really important for driven entrepreneurs like you and me, the owners of companies, but that's also really useful for your team. Yep. And so what I try to coach out of my clients and the people who are I'm lucky enough to have joined my webinars is how do you identify where you find meaning in your work? And then how do you talk about that mm -hmm. through the use of personal stories? Sure. And that's really what I'm all about. That's what my book's about. And I call it From Why to Thrive because there's two types of whys. There's the, your personal why, your personal motivation, and then there's yeah. why you do what you do and how it makes the world a better place. Yeah. So there's a great book called Start With Why by Simon Sinek, and it's talk, it talks about like how great leaders inspire. Yeah. And this is really that second kind of why. This is the like why what you do matters, why what mm -hmm. you do is important, why you existing in the world makes the world a better place. And then there's this other kind of why, which is the personal why, which doesn't get nearly enough attention and which is really the focus of my book, which is every single one of us was seeded from a year early age to do certain kind of things and to value certain kind of things. And there are people who taught us either to value or people who didn't value it and we feel offended by that. And that motivates us into our life in ways that are really unexpected. And I'm really good at like unearthing those personal why or story of me's. Yep. Um, one really quick example is I was speaking to a woman who's a designer and she runs a, a design company. And I was asking her like, why did you do it? Why do you do it? And she kind of hemmed and hawed. And I said, did you used to draw as a child? She said, yes. I said, where did you draw? She said, in my bedroom. I said, describe your bedroom. She said, it had hot pink walls. I said, who designed your bedroom? She said, I did. I said, how did you get the money? She said, my parents took me to design studios uh, and my Michael's, you know, and other places. And they let me pick out my wallpaper. Mm -hmm. And I said, did you, re and then, and then what did you do? Then I drew in that space. And she said, I said, did you realize that you were doing design from an, from an early age and you were empowered and enabled to do that by your parents? And she's like, I've never thought about that, but you're exactly right. It's like, it dates all the way back to then. And yeah. I'm getting goosebumps even thinking about it. Like that was two minutes. That was mm -hmm. a two minute, I just knew what to ask because yep. I knew it was no accident that she was a designer. And I also knew, I mean, I'm a smart guy. Like no, but no parent makes hot pink walls for their kid's <laughs> right, bedroom. Right. Like that yeah. would be obnoxious. So I knew it was the kid designed it therefore. And then she said, that's where she wrote her poetry. And then when I asked her what her mission of her company is, she said to create spaces that are generative and creative. So she had it embedded in her mission that these spaces are for creation. And so I knew, I knew there was something in my gut that told me she must have been doing that for herself, creating spaces. So where did, so the question I asked is where did you create? And she answered in that way. And 
and and and and what what I what I found is over many years of training as a journalist, I was an investigative journalist, and then thousands and thousands of interviews is I've developed a spider sense. Like whenever sen someone says something that I know isn't quite normal or usual, I know to kind of identify and pursue it. And I yeah. rarely am wrong. Like I do find yeah. this interesting yeah. space. So when she said, I like to create spaces that inspire creativity, I've, I've never heard that particular way of describing interior design. Sure. And it just caught, it's like, it's weird. Yeah. Like when you do this long enough, you like, it, it's almost like a, a piece of highlighted text. And I'm yeah. just like, I, I just pursue it and I find it. And what, what I want to do with this book and with my work is to teach you how to do that for yourself yeah, so that you can identify the why. And the reason why is if you do it, you'll be much more connected to your work. You'll be much more likely to survive the ups and downs. You'll be much more aligned with the people you hire. There is a crisis, according to Gallup, in meaningful work. People are quitting. The great resignation is, at its foundation was about people facing death with COVID and realizing that they don't matter at work. Yeah. And they're tired of it. So sure. I quit. So um, is the book is out yet or, or not quite yet? It's out in my brain. In your brain. Okay. I'm like, I want to read this book. <laughs> so <laughs> You can have me back after it's published. Okay. It's, it's a two-year process. Okay. Got it. I'm excited for that. All right. Um, we're going to, we're going to flip, flip roles here and I'm going to give you the opportunity to interview me. What is something that you'd like to ask me, Dan? Well, if you're okay with it, I would like to explore your why for a second. I feel sure. like it, to, hear, to hear somebody describe how to paint without actually painting is a little <laughs> annoying. So let's do it. Are you good with that? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little nervous, but that's you should fun. be. You should be. I'm about to dissect <laughs> your background. No. Okay. So, so, so let me let me just see if I'm on the right page here, and then we'll get started. So, okay. my understanding is that this podcast is really dedicated to supporting kind of fellow agency owners. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Well, I, I started out um, focusing broadly and I've, I've, I've re I've shifted it recently to be focusing on, on yeah, speaking to those in the um, marketing agency owners and those in, in higher level marketing um, roles. Perfect. Yes. And, and, and you still in your day job service clients, right? Absolutely. Yep. yep. But yet you're choosing when you have like an option uh, to service fellow entrepreneurs in the space, fellow agency owners mm -hmm. and other marketing executives. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to do like a little meta, right? Like, so immediately that's an interesting thing to me, right? Because most marketers are more focused on driving like results for their clients. And if they were given, you know, a podcast, they would talk about how to accelerate those results for their clients. And there's, I'm not judging, but you're changing a different role. Like you want to actually build a community mm -hmm. around knowledge, information, and best practices for fellow yes. agency owners. Many of those other people would think of them as competition. Yes. So it's like super cool to me that you have this generosity of spirit where you want to share what you learn and create a community around sure. you of like-minded people. Yep. So my question, okay, so that's like, that's what Dan's little brain is asking is like, sure. it's a what like, that's super cool of you. And then now I'm like, okay, well, um, what I've noticed is that people have, who have a tendency to volunteer um, often. So, so uh, there, there's often like, for those who are of us who are educators at heart, we also have a volunteer spirit. Yep. So have you ever, <laughs> there you go. So like, this is just from life knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so, so can you just tell me a little bit about some of the most important volunteer work you've ever done just really quickly? Oh, I, I mean, right now, my family is a foundation in memory of my late father, where we um, put on events and in order to give out um, scholarship funds to kids to play the sport of hockey. So. Wow. So you have a yeah. family foundation that gives scholarships for hockey. Yep. Um, and that wow. one is very close to me. I mean, it's yeah. memory of my father and I love hockey. He loved hockey. He coached. Um, he was a huge mentor to probably thousands of kids over the years. Um, and so, yeah, this is a, just a 
way to keep giving back. Um, but yeah, I've, I've sat on- And to honor his memory. Yep, absolutely. Live it so forward. That's the one that means the most and is closest to, to me. Yeah, so so I'm going to I'm gonna just, you know, because we have limited time, I'm going to just pursue this thread a little sure. if, it, if I have permission. <laughs> yeah. So forgive me for asking, but how did he pass away? Um, he was killed in a motorcycle accident, fortunately. How old were you? Uh, this happened six years ago. Okay. And I'm sorry to bring it up. Um, yeah, that's okay. How old were you at the time? Uh, 34. Okay. Um, so a lot of the work we do is built on a foundation of trauma. Mm -hmm. I call these stories of fear and stories of love. Um, the reason I started my business is because I was fired in a very public way. It was written in the trade publications for many years. If you Googled my name, it was the first thing that came up. And it was the worst professional moment in my life and one of the worst moments in my life. Mm -hmm. And it propelled me. It just propelled me like a shotgun. For First, I felt incredibly depressed. And then I said, dude, I got to reinvent. You know, I can't be a journalist anymore. So what am I going to do? By the way, the, the story about why I got fired is I don't know. <laughs> um, one thing I do know is I was kind of an asshole, uh, but it wasn't like any of the like normal improprieties of financial or sexual in nature. It was just that I, I was kind of young and I was a little immature, a lot immature. Um, and I, you know, uh, I probably had it come in, but I didn't see the warning signs because I was such a high performer that I thought that would insulate me and, you know, hubris and youthful indiscretion. Uh, like I shouldn't, I was a little arrogant and I, I got my comeuppance. And the reason I couldn't do journalism wasn't so much because of the fact that I was fired. A lot of journalists get fired for all sorts of reasons. It was because I wanted to live in Miami and Miami didn't have any jobs at my level. And so I had to reinvent and I reinvented uh, first as a marketer, then as a marketing educator, because I like to teach what I want to learn. And then mm -hmm. as a, the owner of a marketing academy, a business owner, and it was in business ownership, really, where I found my true passion. So yeah, cool. that's my trauma story. So let me ask you this. Do you think in any small way that the work you're doing with this podcast, serving other agency owners is in some way honoring something that your dad taught you to value or care about? Are you in some small way through the podcast honoring his memory? Oh, 100%, without a doubt. Even the foundation of the podcast initially around networking and building relationships, that was something that my dad taught me um, uh, from, from day one, basically, is like it, life, business, everything is based on relationships. And it's all about... Um, you know, giving first and following through listening, you know, um, like those core principles. I mean, those are things that I observed my dad specifically in, in hockey. Um, like he knew everybody and everyone knew him. And, um, there's a lot of trust and respect that he had earned. Some of that I didn't quite realize until after, you know, he was gone. Um, but yeah, those were things that, um, I really, respect and appreciate that uh, lessons that I was able to to capture from him. So I wanted to give back and in, in the way that I could, you know, I, I'm not, I play hockey. I'm not skilled enough to be able to teach it to others. Maybe someone that's just getting started, I can share what I know thus far, but um, yeah, he, I mean, he was a, a coach and a, a mentor to many, and I kind of try to emulate that and, and trying to give as much as I can. It's beautiful. So let me ask you a question. And then I think, you know, we got to wrap it up. <laughs> yeah, you, you're being very authentic. So, but this is the really, this is kind of the key question. Think back to your time with your dad before you graduated from high school. So, in your childhood, when you're still in grade school, can you tell me a story of a moment when your dad was a networker, a convener, and a mentor, coach, and organizer of hockey? And be as specific as possible. Like, try to tell me about, like one moment that represents that larger thread in your life and in his personality. Oh my gosh, there's so many of them. I mean, I, just whatever I, pops first yeah. in your head. There's something right now you're thinking about. Just tell well, me that story. I, I mean, I remember when he was coaching. Um, like most of our family vacations, we're going to hockey tournaments in different parts of the country, and basically, any we'd go anywhere. Like we grew up in Chicago area. We'd go to a tournament in St. Louis and he'd run into people that he coached, you know, 10 years earlier. 
and they were playing at a more professional level and um you know hey coach joe how are you how are you how's it going you know like they went out of their way to go say hi to him and and like you were my favorite coach and you know just saying i I loved everything you teach me i still do blah 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 blah. and it's like i just it was neat to see that happening as a kid you know and that he had such an impact that you know he'd run into people and they'd go out of their way to to say hi and i try to remember like I, I played travel softball growing up and I couldn't tell you the names of the coaches that I had, you know, so just putting myself in, you know, those, per- those people's shoes going, wow, he had such an impact that they, they remembered him, you know, they knew his name, they saw him and they went on their way to like, say hi to him. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. So, so let me, let me, um, take an attempt to kind of parrot back what I heard and then connect it to the work you're doing. So sure. um, could, could you remind me again? It was coach. Joe. Joe. So, you know, Lori Hybe's dad, Joe, um, was a really well-known um, hockey coach in Chicago where she grew up. And he um, was someone who always had time to give uh, coaching and encouragement to anybody who's willing uh, to listen, who who had a passion for hockey and to help push them along that path to, you know, achieving their best hockey story possible. And that, you know, Lori experienced that because she would see Coach Joe and the way that people reacted to him. And she also experienced it. Was he your softball coach? Um. Uh, he did when I was younger. He did coach me like and a he, two, she even couple experienced years, that yeah, firsthand yeah. when she was a uh, you know in the start of her own career in the mm-hmm. hockey as a as a as a softball player. Mm-hmm. She even got extensive experience coach Joe, coach Joe firsthand, and mm-hmm. you know Joe died tragically unexpectedly in a car accident when she was in her thirties. But those lessons uh, about the importance of mentorship, coaching, guidance and convening community uh, never left her. And so in her professional career, she has always been dedicated to helping her peers and her clients and her employees achieve um, the best that they can achieve um, you know, in, in a spirit of kindness, compassion, and giving, uh, modeling what she learned from Coach Joe. And this podcast that she's created is dedicated to that principle. It's dedicated to Coach Joe. And the idea that we're in this together as agency owners and marketing professionals, we're all in this to try to serve our clients the best way possible. There is no competition. Uh, and I'm I'm here to serve you um, and to honor the memory of my father. Oh, I love that. So that's, that's awesome. what I do. Yeah, that's no, that's what great. I, that's awesome. That's what I do for a living is I, cool. I, I, I talk to people <laughs> I ask them a couple of questions. Sure. And, and so that becomes one story. Mm-hmm. And then you have others, right? Like we can talk about your mom. We can talk about other sure. aspects of your childhood. Yeah. There's probably some really shitty things, you know, and good things and and kind of, cu- cu- and so everybody should have like two or three of these stories that they're ready to deploy at a moment's notice. They're practiced. They have a certain effect they want to create. But here's what I'll tell you about you. Knowing now about Coach Joe, I like you more. <laughs> You know, I, I I like you. I feel for you. I feel like it might, I'm a little sad for you to lose mm-hmm. him too soon, but I feel like what what you were given a gift, um, and the gift was that it probably got you to hear about who he was to people. Mm-hmm. You know, like the saddest thing in the world is when you hear people uh, at a funeral say yeah. things that they didn't tell them when they were alive. Yep, yep. And so you know, you had that opportunity to hear the legacy he left. He probably knew it, but you heard it in high relief. And you just like, it imprinted you, yep. you know, it is now a part of you and you cannot, but do it. And, and did you connect until now coach Joe with this podcast? No, no, so I mean, that's not, the other... not, not to that, not to that extent. I mean, I knew that my networking skills and passion came from my dad, but, um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't connect all those dots. And, and that's very typical as well. Um, sure. This is a beautiful case study of what I do. As an entrepreneur, it's really important for you to understand why you do what you do. Yeah, 100%. Because, because the work we do doesn't pay. Yeah. The work we do is a long road. The work mm-hmm. we do has a high likelihood of failure. You know, the work we do, you lose steam. 
And if you understand why you do what you do and the fact that you actually, this podcast is really honoring the memory of your dad allows you to make it through those hard moments when you're like, what the hell am I doing? Yeah. Why am I keeping at this? Why? And, and it, I'm not saying necessarily that you should always do the podcast. Like if you can't find an audience for the podcast, it might not be the best use of your time. But I know for a fact that you'll just switch, Lori, to another activity that is equally um, you know, honoring, honorific of your father. Sure. Yep, because totally. you just can't help yourself. Like it is so deeply into. So what's really interesting is how few business owners are in touch with this fact. And my favorite example is about a business owner who ran for 35 years, a shoe store. And it was a running shoe store. And it was called the runner's high and he was a marathoner. And so I was interviewing him and he's like, you know, I know this looks like an elite shoe store for runners, but I actually think of it as more as a comfort shoe store. And in fact, most of my clientele are over 70. You know, my spider sense immediately said, that's weird. That's mm -hmm. not what I expected. And, and yeah. you, you, what happens, like, as I say it, it's like equally obvious to anybody listening that that's an unusual thing. So I said to him, comfort shoe store, like most, you know, I thought you were going to be all about elite runners, but you're telling me your clientele is older folks you know, why do you like serving older folks? And he told me a story about his mother. He said, my mother had multiple sclerosis. She was a Mary Kay saleswoman in South Florida. And I used to travel with her to load on and off of her trunk, her wheelchair. And she was the number one Mary Kay representative in South Florida. And she was always uncomfortable. The mm -hmm. shoes she had always hurt. Mm -hmm. And I remember at night, I would mas massage her feet you know, because I'm getting emotional. Uh, I would, I would massage her feet because she was in so much pain mm -hmm. and uh, you know, she's been gone 27 years, uh, but I know she's smiling down and she's proud of me. And I said, did you know when you started the runner's high Byron 35 years ago, that that's what you were doing? He said, I had never connected that until right now. Yeah. That's awesome. Love that. Oh, Dan, I feel like we could ta talk forever about all of these things, but um, we are getting to time here. So um, if if anyone wants to continue this conversation with you, <laughs> uh, what's the best way that they can reach you? Yeah, absolutely. So I run a company called BizHack. Uh, it's at B-I-Z-H-A-C-K dot com. Uh, on there, you can sign up for our newsletter. You also see some of the consulting services we do. So if you want... Uh, to have an example, uh, have for yourself done what Lori, uh, I just did with Lori, um, more than happy to, to work with you. We actually uh, interview you uh, journalistically, and then we have a professional writer who we pair to actually then tell your business story in a way uh, that you've never seen it told before. Cool. That's awesome. All right. We'll include all that information in the show notes. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for the opportunity. It's good talking to you. And thank you for sharing about Coach Joe. May you yeah. rest in peace. Oh, thank you. This wraps up our episode of Social Capital. Huge thank you to Dan for taking the time to connect with us. If you have a burning marketing or relationship question, reach out. I'd love to answer that on the show. And as mentioned before, let's connect on LinkedIn. I'm looking forward to hearing from you shortly. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I encourage you to go out there and get noticed. That's all for this episode of the Social Capital Podcast. Visit socialcapitalpodcast.com for show notes, more episodes, and to see who will be on the show next. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next episode.